Okay, another Mrs. H psychology, AQA psychology, uh, paper three, addiction topic, and this time it is um, an explanation for gambling. This one is the cognitive explanation for gambling. So here we've got the mind map just to show you roughly the format of the mind map, and then I'm going to minimize these branches. So why is it called a cognitive explanation? So it would be important in any of your answers to link in the cognitive. So in terms of initiation of gambling, in terms of maintenance, in terms of relapse. So cognitive theory explains it in terms of their thinking. So for example, their men mental processes, thinking, attention, memory are all linked in terms of the gambling and their behaviors in terms of gambling. And we've got here also that we've got benefits versus costs. So in other words, the gambler, the addictive gambler is weighing up the um, benefits they'll gain versus the costs to them. OK, so again, we've got some mental um, uh, processes and mediation processes um, going on there. OK, and we would say that these are not necessarily going to be conscious on a conscious level. So um, maybe the things like memory and attention aren't operating in terms of a, lo a logical or a rational way. So sometimes it's an, in uh, an unconscious uh, bias as well. So what we'd need to get across is that there is distortion of thinking, distortion of attention maybe, memory, their thinking processes, the way that they process the world around them, and also their recall of memories, um, their existing views, their existing memories, uh, ignoring some and, um, and emphasizing others. So this would lead to irrational thought processes. Now we're going to look at some specifically so let's look at these cognitive biases. We've got four that we're going to talk about. Skill judgment, personal traits, selective recall, and faulty perceptions. So in terms of skill and judgment, we might find that a, an addicted gambler, somebody, who, somebody who's a problem gambler, would have this illusion of control. In other mm. words, they might overestimate their ability to influence random events. So they might think that they're actually able to select the correct lottery numbers, for example. In terms of personal traits, we might have um, somebody who thinks there's a greater probability of winning because they have very special luck or um, they're you know, they have superstitious behaviors that will enable them to be more lucky. So they think there's something about their personality, something not personality, but to do with their own um, individual traits that enables them to be more able than others to be lucky or something like that. Selective recall, um, that they will remember details of their wins, but they choose or um, either consciously or unconsciously to forget or they ignore or they discard their losses. So, um, you know, they just will find a way of saying, well, that's an unexplained mystery, but they don't really recall the times that they've, you know, the many, many times where they haven't actually won anything. And also faulty perceptions, you know, the belief that maybe their losing streak won't last and that they are about to win, that at any point they're now going to win. So even though they've been on a losing streak, as it were, um, you know, the next time is, is going to be their moment. So remember, these are involved in terms of their maintenance of the problem, the problem gambling, and also you know their their biases involved in terms of relapse. So things like their their overestimation of their um, skill and their own skill and judgment might mean that they maintain their gambling behaviour. Um, selective recall might be involved in terms of their uh, relapse because they're forgetting the times. That they they the many many times where they have lost. We could also bring in self-efficacy here, in terms of you know the amount they relapse, the individual differences in terms of how they relapse or how successful they are at abstaining, um, keeping away from more gambling. Um, we can say that their self-efficacy 
efficacy in terms of whether they believe they are actually capable of giving up permanently. Sometimes we see a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is also a cognitive function, um, a cognitive element, because if they fail, in other words, they don't manage to avoid gambling, they might say, well, you see, I told you so, I couldn't, I told you I couldn't do it. So and and um, so when they fail, that's kind of reinforcing this belief that they can't do it. So that's another cognitive um, element as well that we could introduce. So let's now look at the research that we've got. OK, we're going to start with the Griffiths, the Mark Griffiths study, 1994. Let's have a look at this. OK, so he investi investigated cognitive bias in gamblers. And he used um, regular slot gamblers versus occasional gamblers. And he used a thinking aloud method, i.e. a sort of introspection. And what he was trying to do was compare thinking processes between these regular slot gamblers with the occasional slot gamblers. And so what they had to do was they had to verbalise their thoughts. So this thinking aloud, they had to verbalise their thoughts as they played. He also used a content analysis. So classifying these into what he called or what he decided were rational and irrational thought processes. Also used um, semi-structured interviews uh, on the participants' opinions about this, the, the amount of skill they needed to win. And he observed them as well. So what's great about this is plenty of different research methods to try and counter when we've got strengths in one, countering the weaknesses in another. So um, pretty good in terms of the different methodologies. Uh, what he found was that the regulars didn't actually win anymore, but the, the regular gamblers made more irrational thoughts. Okay, so for example, 14% against 2.5% of the um, those classified as occasional gamblers. Um, and it was especially this illusion of control. What he found was, you know, they but really believed that they had more control, or they had um, they had the skill that was necessary um, in order to win. And remember, this is these are random things like uh, scratch cards and lottery that they have no control over. So they overestimated the, the amount of control, and they overestimated the amount of um, skill needed in order to, to, to have a win. Let's have a look at Rogers next. So, Rogers. He examined cognitive bias in gamblers, but this time with uh, lottery, buying, lottery buying tickets. And he found a cognitive bias in their reasoning behind buying them. So, for, again, for example, again, um, overestimating the personal luck that they had overestimating the, the illusion of control that they had and also having a real unrealistic optimism about their um, possibility of winning. So a cognitive bias was a real key feature there. And then the third one, Tonelto. So Tonelto reviewed the literature, so in other words it was secondary data, and again he found key biases, so exaggerating their own skills. So these um, problem gamblers really exaggerated their own skills. So all of this research showing reliable findings that, that there is a cognitive process going on. So providing, providing scientific um, objective data for the fact that there, these uh, problem gamblers do have um, distorted thinking processes. So let's move on to the evaluation. We've got separate points here. We've got strengths, problems, and alternatives. So let's have a look at the strengths first of all. OK, so if I just make this a little bit larger. OK, so what's good about this is, um, and this the fact that this can be identified, these cognitive processes identified, is that we can have a practical application from that, i.e. CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. So the idea is that the um, somebody with an addiction may have different ways of thinking, and that implies that we can have a, a treatment programme that could help them. So CBT addresses distorted thinking, and 
we know that, for example, with that distorted thinking, they play they place a great significance on the fact that they were so close to winning, and in fact, they just had a near miss. Um, they were so close, but they seem to um, rate that as very important. And so th that sort of distorted thinking can be tackled, really, with CBT. And if you remember from year one, with CBT, you can do little homework tasks and um, get the clients to do homework tasks where they're actually challenging those distorted beliefs. Um, they do, you know, they, they go and find the scientific evidence to challenge that. So perhaps getting them to record the number of times they play and don't win. So they've got objective data in front of them to try to help them. And obviously all the research, um, supporting research also can be used. So these pieces of research that you've got uh, that we've already covered can be used. But we've also got another piece of research. So I'm using, I'm referring to the Illuminate uh, Pink Haired Girl uh, revision book here. It's page 239 for those of you who have that reference. So here I'm looking at the McCusker study. I've misspelled it there. It's McCusker, McCusker and Gettings. They asked participants to complete a modified Stroop procedure and participants had to pay attention to ink colour whilst they ignored the word meaning. So if you remember the Stroop effect, little task. Now, so what happened was that gamblers took longer to do this compared to a control group when gambling words were shown. And that suggests that gamblers have an automatic cognitive bias to pay attention to gambling type information, um, vocabulary, stimuli that is gambling related. So that supports the view that cognitive explanation um, biases can influence these, this addiction and um, even without us even being aware of it. So it explains this sort of automatic behavior. And um, as we've already mentioned, we've got plenty of other supporting evidence as we've talked about here with Tonelto, Rogers and Griffiths. So you've got other uh, evidence there. And obviously the more evidence we have, the more reliability we have with this. And that um, provides us with more validity that this is a valid explanation as well. So let's go on to the problems. Let's have a look at these. Okay, so first one, problems with self-reports. So problems with methodological issues, and in other words, self-reports in this case. So as we've already seen with, for example, the Griffith study, the participants were doing um, self -report. they were doing an introspection, they were thinking out loud. And obviously that then is a self-report. It's, um, it's expressing themselves as very subjective view. Now, the problem with that, any self-report is, you know, we do have issues of reliability with it because it doesn't re necessarily represent what they really think. Um, what they're saying is not necessarily what they're thinking. OK, so Dickinson et al., for example, um, critics say, you know, what they're actually saying may not be what they are thinking. So therefore, again, these sort of this sort of data has um, issues with validity. Are we really testing what we think we're testing? So that's a problem there. Another problem, um, research correlations and issues with causal links. Um, because if we have correlational research, we can't always assume that there is this causal link between the problem user and their way of thinking. Okay, it could be that the faulty thinking is the result of problem using. So the problem, you know, the actual fact that they are a problem user has caused faulty thinking as opposed to the other way around, which is what is always assumed. So, um, you know, it's eff effectively like chicken and egg issue. We also have another evaluative point with um, individual differences, another problem with individual differences. So for example, Berger and Smith found that people with high levels of control motivation, in other words, you know, a desire to have control over their lives, so we call that control motivation, were more likely to believe they could influence chance. They could, they had a much stronger influence over chance determined chance related situations. So it may be that these sort of people are attracted to certain types of gambling where they assume, where they wrongly believe that their, their so-called skill will make a difference. So they believe that their so-called skill 
would help them in choosing the correct lottery numbers. Okay, so these individual differences in personality mean that we um, we can't just say that the cognitive bias is the only explanation. There may be other individual differences as well. And of course, we've got alternative explanations. So we've already covered and you've got a little video on learning theory of gambling, which you can use as an alternative and introduce a key point of learning theory as an alternative to this gambling one. So key also just make sure that when you're developing your evaluations that you are fully developing, think through in terms of, you know, are there issues with generalizing, are there issues with reliability, validity, and at the end of the day, those issues mean we lack scientific credibility. We lack objectivity. Science expects objectivity. So we've got problems with that. Think about samples. So um, try to fully develop your AO3. So try not to just say there's a problem with causal links and end there. Try to develop that a little bit. Don't just say methodological issues. Explain why in this particular case self-reports are a problem, etc., etc.